Brothers and sisters, we are a part of a movement around the world today to pray for, to weep with, and to be strengthened by persecuted believers around the world. I know some of their stories personally, had the opportunity uh, with Lori one time in a city where they pulled pastors and house church leaders out of a persecuted country to share with them the greatness and richness of God and how you can trust in them. And what I have found each time I've gone, I believe I've gone three times planning God willing to go again soon, that I am as strengthened by them as they say they are strengthened by the ministry. Interestingly enough, one of my precious friends there, I'll tell you his story a little bit later in the message, uh, when he took notes, literally every word that I said he wrote down and I was told later by Tony that he even wrote down when I coughed, he would put Pastor coughed. So I, I'm not entirely sure if when he took that and taught that in Iran, if he actually coughed at the same place I did, I don't know. But what an encouragement and blessing that God has chosen us as a church to have such a tremendous worldwide impact through Tony, through you sending me, through our resources, and I am so thankful that we can be a part of their suffering, a part of honoring God with them in partnership by praying, yes, but also by you sending me, by going, by us supporting Tony and by seeing the impact of that in their lives. The man you will hear from tonight is a man who is impacted by the gospel from the conferences and then has stood firm, has suffered immensely, and has been faithful. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I hope that you do, we are going to take a break from our study of the book of Revelation to look at what we can learn from the persecuted church, or maybe more importantly, what we can learn from the apostle Paul, who I think is a very good representative of them. The chapter I would like you to turn to is in 2 Corinthians, and it's chapter 4. This happens to be one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, in fact, was what I chose upon graduation from Bible college many, many years ago to be a part of my life verses. I think it's precious in so many ways because it holds us firm, helps us to stay faithful to Jesus, His, his word, His church, his, his people in the midst of a world that is broken. Sometimes when we come to a passage like this, and we'll take the time to read the entire chapter and then just look at some highlights, I think you could spend months in a chapter like this and not exhaust it. We come to a chapter like this, and if we're in the context of this international day of prayer for the persecuted church, we might feel a little bit overwhelmed at their pain and underwhelmed at ours. And yet each of us lives in a broken world. And each of us in the flesh and the demonic world and the narratives of the internet or mainstream media or really just the world around us struggles to live faithfully for Jesus, struggles to keep our focus on him and to live with a passion to be ministers of the gospel. The context of this chapter is very important. You'll notice that the first words you'll see are the Words that call attention backwards. Therefore, having this ministry. Having what ministry? Well, being a part of God's workers in the world. Some commentators would say this is exclusive to Paul, but that is just not the case. You can see that by how he interacts with people throughout this entire chapter and then stretch it throughout this entire book. It's a call to all of us. We've been called to be on ministry alertness engagement for God. I think so often, and just give this kind of as an introduction, we've learned to think of ourselves in this era, in this time frame, as victims. And victims who need a Savior, they want a Savior to save them from their pain, to make their world okay, to give them health and wealth and prosperity. That is not how the Bible understands who we are without Christ. We We are those who are his enemies at work against him who deserve his justice and wrath. And when he saves us by grace through faith, he places us, this is the amazing privilege of gospel ministry, on mission for him. 
With that perspective, this chapter will make sense. Without it, it won't. Because this chapter is not only an assumption and promise of pain or storms in life, but also how we can exist faithful to God, faithful to what he has called us to do in the midst of this broken and horrifically painful world. So I want to read it with you. We'll comment as we go through it. Again, would love for you to have open Bibles. If you don't, it will be on the overhead Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we don't deserve it. We do not lose heart. We're going to see this mentioned here and then again at the end of the chapter. It's really the theme. Don't lose heart. By the way, we'll see this again. If this is the declaration of the Apostle Paul, perhaps we should pay attention because if we want to be faithful to God, there will be a danger in this world, but not of this world, of losing heart. We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways, and we have refused to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. He wants to be successful God's way in God's power, not in the world's. And this is how God does it. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They're blinded, some say here, by the world's system. I think, yes, that's true, although I think here very clearly the demonic realm is at work in blinding people from the obvious greatness and glory of Jesus. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. This is his understanding of ministry. Jesus is Lord, I am his slave. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That is the glory of the gospel. Verse 7, one of my favorite for teaching pastoral ministry, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who are alive live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. In other words, we suffer for our own sake to grow, for your sake to help you get this life of Jesus, and mostly for the glory of God. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with him into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. That should remind us of Romans chapter 1 and really the heart of who we want to be. Those who are thankful always and constantly live in a way that glorifies our God. So we do not lose heart. There's the theme, the kind of sandwich that we're given. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What a powerful chapter from God's Word. And there is so much we could learn here. I want us to hesitate in our learning, hesitate as we walk through it, on four lessons from the persecuted church. Or perhaps, more accurately, four lessons from the persecuted Paul. And you might say, well, how are they 
mm, applicable to our lives because we want the word of God to sing in our own hearts so that we align ourselves with God and his word. And my answer is twofold. One, I do believe that we are in a space where persecution, if we're faithful to God and joint, don't join into the political mess or the fighting of that political mess, but just stay loyal to God and his gospel and his word, we will face persecution. I believe persecution from both extremes, from the zealots and the Pharisees. But I believe if God chooses not to bring repentance and renewal to the church in Canada, those who long to stay faithful will face persecution. I'm not a prophet. But as we study church history, it is a pretty consistent pattern. But the second reason, perhaps more important, we live in a broken world. And in this world, we will have trouble Trouble from our own sin, trouble from our own situation, whether that's health or relationships or those sort of things. We we will face turmoil and there's this temptation to lose heart. And what we find in this chapter is this incredible, passionate plea for God's people not to lose heart. And so maybe today you're struggling in relationships or with your situation or with what's going on in the world or with who, who knows what. And you're weary and you're feeling like giving up and not being faithful to God or loyal to God's people or whatever that temptation is coming your way to give in to sin maybe in your life. And this chapter is not only a call to not lose heart, a a call to faithfulness to God, but also a pattern with a little bit of work that we can follow. And so let's follow lesson number one. I've just called this don't lose heart. It's in verses 1 to 5, and it's just this declaration. Listen, there are struggles in the world, and there will be temptations for all of us to lose heart. Maybe we don't think we're accomplishing great things. Maybe temptations to be like the world, or align ourselves with worldly things, or maybe maybe just health situations, or work situations, or church situations that are difficult. What does it mean to lose heart? The answer is to abandon oneself. This is what one Greek scholar says, to cowardly surrender. In other words, God wants us to be those who have hearts filled with devotion to Him, regardless of the situations, who are thankful and fixated and focused on Him and gospel ministry, not to be distracted by other things or disoriented by pain or pleasure, but to have this fixation on Him. To be those faithful to gospel ministry, to build the church, to to bring unity and joy to those who love Jesus with us. This, This is our calling and yet so often in the world we can find that our hearts are distracted, disoriented and we can be those who surrender. It's interesting as you study what's happened to pastors over the last two years, many are calling it the great realignment, but what we're discovering is so many are resigning and leaving the ministry altogether. And I don't think pastors are alone in this. We're we're discovering that many Christians are not coming back to church. They're they're staying home, and and some for health reasons, but others just because they don't want to re-engage. We're finding this apathy, not just in the church, but the fact that it's in the church is so important for us to just awaken in our own hearts. Oh, God, I don't want to be someone who gives up. I I want to be someone who aligns my life with you. Oh, God, I don't want to lose heart. As I interact with others around the world and sometimes even with my own heart, I discover that we, we can see what's going on. Cry to God, oh God, restore the joy. Oh God, remove the division over things that are so secondary. Oh God, why, why is health issues so severe? What, why are things happening? Why? And I think this passage moves us from the why to the who. We'll get there in just a minute. But it displays not only who we are in our own weakness weakened ways in the world, but also the power and glory and supremacy of God. Why not give up? Well, the foundation of this in chapter 3, and this is so important, it's because we see the glory of Jesus. 
And that glory has so transformed us and will continue to transform us if we keep our fixation there that we can now live in a way that we become ministers of the gospel. That's that's how Paul defines it in chapter three. So here's the idea. I see Jesus. I behold his glory. I conform to his image. I love him with ever more deepening joy and passion and delight, this treasure that supersedes all other things. And I, I have this so delight in him that now I stand firm and let nothing move me and distractions are removed and yet if you're anything like me and you are there will be times where your heart is heavy perhaps even a little blinded and you forget the privilege of being saved by the gospel and become a victim of your circumstances or other people You forget the privilege and glory of being called to be a part of the plan of God, to love others, to to build His church, to reach out across the world, and you become isolated and your heart is iced. And you can lose heart. So here's this passionate cry from one who went through so much. We're going to look at a few of those brief things saying to us, "Don't, don't lose heart. Yes, in this world you will have trouble. Yes, in this world there will be things that cause you to feel overwhelmed. Don't don't lose heart. The persecuted church needs this. So do we. Secondly, depend on His power. You can't stand firm on your own. Here, verse 7, he compares us to a clay pot. Now, we we might, or jars of clay, we we might not understand how demeaning this is, but these are the penny pots. They're, They're basically useless. You make them really quick, you use them. In fact, some scholars think that these are actually referring to what they went to the bathroom in. They just they just had no value. I want us to understand that in many other places the Bible expresses our value. We're God's treasured possession. We're Jesus' work of art. We're we're those who are filled with the Spirit and accomplish the work of God. But what what Paul is trying to help us to understand is if we we get who we are in our own weakness and frailty in the midst of the broken world, then we'll rely completely on the power of God. In fact, Paul says elsewhere, we want to be those who boast in our weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on us. What he wants us to see here is don't lose heart. You're just a clay pot. This is a broken world. There are hurtful things that will happen to you. You'll be devalued by other people, by situations, accused by the demonic realm. All of these circumstances that happen in a broken world. If Jesus doesn't return, 100% of us will die. Listen, here's, here's what he's trying to say. In the midst of that broken world, you have this treasure inside of you. So valuable so amazing that it allows you to take on value as a clay pot. We we are, verse 11, always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, always living in a world that is broken for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. What is this meaning? It's meaning that we go through pain and trial here as treasured children of God in the midst of our frailty to show what it means to value Jesus above everything. That's what it means, his power at work in us to display that when we suffer, we suffer differently than those around us. We suffer as those with hope, with joy, with treasure. And so his power in us, this cracked pot that you see before you, has inside of me a treasure beyond measure. The weaker we are, the more dependent we realize we need to be. And this passage shouts it out really over and over again. We need to show our dependence by praying, by praying together, praying alone. We need to show our dependence that when we feel overwhelmed, when we feel like giving up, we realize this battle is not our own. We're strong in the Lord and in His mighty power, Ephesians 6. We realize that our God is literally looking, his eyes roaming throughout the whole world, looking for those whom he can strengthen with his mighty power. 
If you try to live the Christian life on your own, you will very quickly become disoriented. You will very quickly experience despair. And you will very quickly become Satan's tool to divide and destroy other believers. You can't do it. You're a clay pot. See yourself correctly and then value what God has chosen to do in you by displaying the incredible beauty of who he is and what he has done. The real question, Hudson Taylor asked this so powerfully. Are you weak enough, aware of your weakness enough, to be used by God? If you are, if you understand this, then all of a sudden you say, okay, then I'm dependent. And when I'm dependent, then I'm powerful. I used to, on my paper road, I think I've shared this story before, walk through a back alley. And the back alley was very frightening for me. It was dark and it was long, miles and miles and miles long. I've walked it recently and it didn't seem nearly as dark or as long. But when I was a child, it was uphill both ways, black, dark, and there were mean dogs and snakes the whole way through it. And often I didn't go through that dark alley and the person at the other end, there's only one, he didn't get his paper or they didn't get their paper because that alley scared me. But on Sunday mornings, the paper was delivered Sunday mornings, I'd get up early and my dad was with me. And when my dad was with me, first of all, the papers were light because he was carrying them. And secondly, the, the alley wasn't frightening for me. Even one time when we were attacked by dogs, two, two dogs that were trying to show off to one another to destroy us, and I ducked in behind my dad, and he made me safe. See, on my own, it was frightening and dark and alone, and yeah, there were things to be afraid of. Perhaps not snakes, but perhaps other things. On your own, you have every reason to be anxious in this world. You have every reason to be afraid. You're just a cracked pot, a clay pot. You, you are frail physically. I mean, tomorrow you could get sick and die the next day. You could get in a car accident. You are frail emotionally, no matter how strong you feel. It might be that you're anxious and then that anxiety overwhelms and cripples you. You, you are frail. But if you live dependent in the presence of God, on Him, that treasure that is inside of you, you will be strong all of the time. I love how one Bible scholar states it. By using frail and expendable people, God makes it clear that salvation is a result of His power and not any power His messengers could generate. The great power of God to overcome and transcends the the world transcends who he uses. He uses clay pots. The messenger's weakness is not fatal to what he does. It is essential. God, I'm weak enough. You can use me. That's how we need to feel. I wish I could take the time. I don't have the time to show you that what Paul does with that is he says, I won't, I won't be like the world. I won't get caught up in the world's way. I'm going to stay loyal to the word of God. We'll talk about it a little bit in our implications, God willing. But he says, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to choose their ways. I'm not going to try to trick you. I'm just going to preach the word and let the spirit of God use the word of God to transform the people of God and accomplish his will. Lesson number one, we need to be those who understand very clearly that this world will be filled with things that could cause us to hurt. We need to not lose heart. Lesson number two, we need to depend on his power. Lesson number three, we need to delight in his glory. Or I suppose I could have said this if I didn't need another D word. We need to have a radical God-centeredness. If you see yourself as a victim, you will discover that you are a victim of your circumstances. But if you see God as glorious and yourself as his child, his servant, the one who gets the opportunity to accomplish his ministry, then everything changes. Now when pain comes your way, be that physical, spiritual, or emotional, your first and repeated question is, God, how do I show how awesome you are in the midst of the struggle? How can I be so radically God-centered that I can say to live as Christ, to die as gain? How can I display that God is worth it, that those who trust in Him have hope in Him? How can I show that He is truly my greatest treasure? Now you back up for a minute and say, as the phone rings, 
I struggle with this. I struggled with this this week. Things happen in life that hurt us or confuse us or things that upset us that are from a worldly perspective. And this text just draws us back to this. Verse 15, really, most declaratively, this becomes our greatest passion and our greatest joy. For it is for your sake, this is his suffering, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. It may increase bringing glory and honor to God. It may increase God-centeredness around the world. Oh, brother, oh, sister, if we could learn this, then anything that happens to us, as small as confusion in a world over COVID or as big as cancer in our lives or persecution or slander coming your way or you fill in the blank, our first and repeated question would be, how do we bring glory to God in this circumstance? How do I show that God is awesome and worth trusting? How do I help others see Him and savor Him and trust in Him? And It's really declaring that if we see all of life about Jesus, which again, this is repeated over and over again in the Bible. This, this is what we call you to over and over again, but we struggle with because of the modern worldview that would prefer we have Jesus on Sundays and then forget him as quickly as possible? If we could get this, then our pain all of a sudden has purpose. And those around us can be given through our suffering and our situation and our brokenness hope. And then if we do this well in the power of the Spirit, not depending on our own strength, but depending on God, if we see ourselves correctly and see Him correctly, then all of a sudden this display of His light, the Holy Spirit will use to remove the blindness from the world and the demonic realm and people will come to trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior around us because we're filled with His light and passionate about His glory. It truly is a worldview shift that we must continually be making because the world says it's all about you and your comfort in Canada right now or wherever you reside. And God says it's all about me and my glory and your privilege to take my message to people that don't have it, to display my beauty to people that need to see it, to encourage and build up the family of God and bring unity and joy and passion and light and maturity Oh, that we would understand this and move from victimhood to the privilege of being victors in Christ who in the midst of brokenness and in the midst of circumstances that may cause everyone else to lose heart around us, we fixate on Jesus and display the power and glory of the gospel. I truly believe, we've seen this in our own lives, that the greatest difference that's on display between authentic Christians and the world is how we handle and respond to turmoil. And I think we'll see that on display tonight in the persecuted church. So often where pleasure is our greatest goal, we won't see it. And oh, that we would respond in our own lives to the greatness of the treasure of God, the privilege of being one of his jars of clay that we might respond in all of life not losing heart but living on mission for him I remember the story of a young man this is quite an old story you may have heard it before he went on a missions trip to China and one of the great questions he had as he wept before the Lord and going to China is oh God how could you allow these wonderful people to be persecuted one of my weeping prayer requests when I've been in these conferences as they've gone home to sure persecution and it happened and he went to China he saw their strength and their passion for Jesus and their willingness to die for him their their declaration not only in words but in life to live is Christ it's all about him everything else is secondary to die is gain and They say that when he came back from that mission, his question was no longer, oh God, if you love the church in China, why do you allow them to suffer? But he switched it to, oh God, if you love the church in the United States, why don't you allow her to suffer? He had a radical perspective change. And the reason, by the way, I don't want us to suffer for the record, but we will. 
His radical perspective change shifted from us and our safety being at the center to God and his glory being at the center. And now every response to life becomes, God, let me show how great you are. Let me display your love. Let me rejoice in the richness of your power. Don't lose heart. Depend on God's power. Delight in God's glory. And now we get to look at ourselves a little. Distinguish what is eternal. I love verses 16 to 18. These are the verses I put when I graduated. They let you put your verses, your life verses on the yearbook. So if you went back to Briarcrest in 1992, yes, I'm that old, you would discover these words in someone, in the face of someone you wouldn't recognize. So we do not lose heart. Repeat it. Though our outer self is wasting away, he doesn't deny the trouble, physical, spiritual, and emotional that we're in, but he's saying inside we are strong, we're being renewed day by day by the power and presence of God. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Oh, if we could listen to this, we would be so much better off. Now and in eternity. See, what he's saying is simply this. Eternity is real. Heaven is real. Live in light of heaven and you will discover that everything you sacrifice here, all of your brokenness, all of your despair, all of the things that went wrong, if your eyes are on eternity, it is worth it. I just want to do a full stop. If I said to you, if you're willing to walk down a three-mile-long dark back alley filled with snakes and dogs but I can guarantee your safety, at least guarantee you'll get through it. And at the other end, I'm going to give you $10,000. How many of you would do it? Yeah, the light and... Well, for those of you who didn't raise hands, shame on you. You just lied right in front of all these people. (laughs) Now here's Paul saying, listen, if we understand eternity, then... Everything that happens to us is light and momentary. And I go, wait wait a minute, Paul. What are you talking about that's light and momentary? He tells us. He says, imprisonments, beatings, stoning, shipwrecks, dangers, hard labor, sleeplessness, hunger, exposure, betrayal from his closest friends, those around him giving up when it just got a little bit hard on missions trips. And he could go on and on and on. And if we compared our lives to his, we would say, Paul, you're... Your situation definitely should not be described as light or momentary unless you're not comparing it with my troubles, you're comparing it with eternity. So compare for me a second with a minute or a second with an hour or a second with a year or a second with a billion years. Now, I get a second's light and momentary for us anyway, right? Boom, it's gone. We'll never get that one back. But start comparing your life with the billions and billions. And when we've been there 10,000 years, we've no less days to sing His praise than when we first began. Do you understand the enormity of eternity? No, neither do I. But if we can glimpse it, if we can fixate upon What isn't seen, I love his words here, right? We take our eyes, physical, and we look at things that we can't see. Because if we can see those things we can't see, then everything else becomes in alignment with that. And we serve for eternity, for the glory of our King. We're achieving a glory that far outweighs them all. Oh, that we could see this. Okay, this is a service for the persecuted church, and I have just made it about us. But I think if we understand this and live this way, we will join the persecuted as partners, which we already have. I'm so proud of this family for that, the amazing impact we've had. But also, probably, unless God so chooses to change Canada and its direction, as participants. So as we prepare... 
to live our lives for God? How should we do that? What are the implications of this day, of this passage? And I have three for us. I want to move through them rapidly. The first, let's be those who submit to the Lordship of Jesus. Had we taken the time to slow down a little bit, we would have saw this declaration of the Lordship of Jesus. Jesus is Lord, not comfort or culture. Not politics, if you're American. Do we have any Americans here? If you watch American news, what's on the news right now? Something happening on Tuesday, right? Midterms, yeah. We don't have to worry about those as Christians, right? Even if the wrong party, whoever you decide that is, gets in. See, brothers and sisters, all of a sudden we're living our lives in submission to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and everything here on earth becomes secondary. If we see this, our politics become eternal. And the person of Jesus, we fully submit to as Lord. In in light of this passage, it means you don't tamper with His Word. It means you fix your eyes on Him and on eternity. Then it means you take every opportunity in the midst of suffering to point people to the Gospel. You see yourself not as an earth dweller, but a minister of the Gospel who is going to live for eternity in the presence of Jesus. Secondly, savor his sovereignty even in suffering. It was about 3 a.m. in the morning. And there was a loud knock on the door that woke up this couple. They were nervous because he had been in jail already before, but he went to the door and there were at the door some secret police. It's in Iran. And they knocked through the door, they barged in, they threw him up against the wall, the wife started to weep, she had seen her husband go to jail before, in fact they'd removed their daughters because the secret police had threatened them with rape some years before. As they threw him against the wall, they accused him of being a follower of Jesus and As they cried out, what have we done wrong? They said, some years ago when you were in prison, you signed something that said you wouldn't do this anymore and you broke your word. You wouldn't host house churches. You wouldn't help people grow. You're going back to jail and we're going to forget you there. She wept. He was resolute and went to jail and there he was forgotten. He Didn't know what to do there. He wanted to represent Jesus well. And so he finally said, can I have a key to the library? And they said, sure, because they wanted to convert him to Muslim religion. And all of the books there were that way. And so they sent him into the library. He said, well, can I have some paper? I want to write some things down. And they said, sure. And so he went into the library. He was all alone there. It was quiet. It was safe. And he started to remember some of the things he had learned from the conferences that our church puts on. He started to write them down and take notes and he'd keep his notes there. He'd hide them in different places, but he didn't realize that they were actually watching him write these things down. So one day, three or four of the guards burst in and they took his notes and they read them. He was afraid, but then one guard said to them, what kind of teaching is this? We want you to teach this to our other prisoners. And they actually asked him during times to teach the other prisoners these teachings that he was writing down. And so he started to do that. He tried to avoid speaking loudly about Jesus, but certainly spoke quietly about him. And he shared those things he had learned at the conference with those in the prison. And part of what he shared is that God values men and women. We're created equal, but different. There's a dignity to being a woman, which in that culture is so difficult for them to hear. And some of the men heard this and started to believe and change their world system. And even went home when they got out of jail, he was still in jail and said sorry to their wives. For the way they had treated them, second class citizens. This shocked their wives. So their wives asked, why is this? And they said, well, we heard from this person in prison and he told us we needed to treat you differently and act differently. And so these women said, well, where are they? And they went and they, unfortunately, Mustafa was still in jail, but they went to see his wife and she was able to share the gospel with them. And this man suffered immensely in jail and then finally they released him on the promise that he wouldn't start any other house churches. But he noticed that his ministry in jail had already produced new contacts and new people that he could share Jesus with. This man is my friend. And when he suffered, he had suffered before I met him. 
when he was at the conference I was at, he was going back to suffering and when he found out that I might be going back to serve the church, he said, Tony, I'm in. I want to go, even if it means to go back to jail. But what would drive him to respond to a situation like that and put his life at risk repeatedly? And the answer is he understands who God is. The glory of the call on his life with the gospel. The eternal reward. And the privilege of serving under the sovereignty of God all of the time. Here's a man who had his ministry multiplied in jail. And here's fantastic for me when we talk about this. My ministry on your behalf multiplied in an Iranian prison in the last few years. Isn't God awesome? Brothers and sisters, today we participate by surrendering our understanding of the temporary and having a passion for the eternal. We participate by saying we will be so gloriously impacted by our experience of the gospel that we will open our arms and say, I want to live under and in the full agreement with the lordship of Jesus regardless of the cost and I'm going to join my brothers and sisters around the world and say with this ministry we won't lose heart we will keep our eyes on Jesus and on the eternal and we will store up treasures in heaven and never lose sight of whom we serve and why we serve him we will say with our brothers and sisters in Iran in Afghanistan, and Nigeria, and so many other places. This home on earth is temporary. Here we're strangers and aliens. But where we're going, and we'd love for you to join us on the journey, and then there, is for all eternity. Sometimes we just lose sight of the temporary because it hurts so much, the eternal blacked away. I, I often, when I do this, I like to mark up our walls. So, Wilf, if you're watching, and cameraman, this is not going to be easy, but we'll try. I, I want to put a dot on the wall. I'm going to go way over here. I have my pen, trusty pen. I have now put a dot on this wall. If Wilf's not here, don't tell him. How many of you can see the dot I put on the wall? How many can see the wall? Wouldn't we be those who are wise if we live for the wall, not the dot? For the king, not the temporary. For the eternal, not what is so short. And really, only in light of eternity gains its meaning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you for your people all around the world today who will pray and partner with the persecuted church. God, we thank you for the privilege of learning from them and from Paul. Would you, in the power of your spirit, make us strong so that we don't lose heart, make us powerful in our experience of your grace so that we are active ministers of the gospel regardless of what comes and we see your sovereignty in our suffering and trust in you completely and submit fully to your lordship and live on mission for you regardless of the cost. Would you forgive us for being distracted and disoriented? Would you give us in the fullness of your spirit a new passion for what really matters? That we might see ourselves as jars of clay with treasure beyond measure inside. So that you would receive all of the glory. God, would you overwhelm us today as we now move to celebrating communion with the richness of your gospel, the reality of your love and the community you have called us to live in, that we might be those who live in you and for you. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.